thank you everyone for joining us today on the Equestrian Canada National Equine Disease and Welfare Surveillance Call. Um, as you can tell, I am not Dr. Melanie Barham. I will be replacing her as a facilitator today. Um, so this is an in initiative by the Health and Welfare Committee of Equestrian Canada to ensure we meet monthly and discuss national D disease surveillance and welfare surveillance as well. Um, today, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Holly Habig of the Hawthorne Veterinary Clinic to discuss and give an overview of um, influenza cases at uh, equestrian shows and competitions in Ohio. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And this is my first time on, so I apologize if I speak um, or, or, or don't speak about the right things, but I'll, I'll do the best that I can to recap on our situation here in central Ohio um, and actually throughout the Midwest right now um, and what's going on with equine influenza. And then if you have any questions at the end, obviously feel free to ask me or call me privately uh, if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> pretty much about 30 days ago, um, well, well, let me preface that by stating that I work primarily as, as a show veterinarian in central Ohio. We have a large indoor show facility here that houses approximately five to 600 horses uh, throughout the winter. Uh, horses are coming and going every single week. Um, I also work in Kentucky at the show vet, as well as another location in Ohio um, throughout the summer. Um, so this is primarily what I do. And what happened was about 30 days ago, we got a phone call from some horses that had been uh, at our competition and had gone home. Um, on Tuesday or Wednesday after leaving on Sunday and had a low-grade fever, cough, nasal discharge. Um, they were tested for equine influenza. Um, we found out on, I think it was Friday night or Saturday morning, um, that they were positive for equine influenza. And at that point, um, you know, obviously we were, we were looking very closely and, and recommending to tell all of our exhibitors to take temperatures and, and to be um, looking out for, for any horses with clinical signs. Um, at that point on Sunday, literally as everyone was about to go home, we had three horses pop up with a low-grade fever, um, some nasal discharge. Uh, one of the trainers came forward and said, hey, I've got a couple horses coughing, and, you know, I think, you know, they might have had a fever, but I gave them banamine and showed them through the weekend. <laughs> and um, as you can imagine, um, those guys, th those guys uh, ended up being, taking a little longer to recover than, than the rest of them. But um, it started out, we had three horses. Um, we did put them into a voluntary isolation. In the state of Ohio, there is no quarantine. There's no nothing that the state of Ohio does to regulate influenza. Um, but we took it upon ourselves as the horse show to put the horses into another, um, a separate barn that's not connected to the horse show. Um, and obviously, we, we chose to go ahead and inform our exhibitors and inform the public of what was going on. Um, those horses, those original horses, we had three walk in, and then on Monday, I had two more. So we, so we really had an original five horses in there. Um, had low-grade fevers, uh, quite a bit of nasal discharge, and um, then a cough for about 10 days, um, pretty nasty cough. Those horses where I think that the trainer was kind of um, giving them banamine, trying to give them dex for the cough. Those guys really took a while um, to heal. Um, they were not until about day 20 did they test negative for equine influenza. And just to say, we were doing all of our testing uh, with the nasal swab by PCR. Um, I did do uh, when I tested them. I tested them. Uh, I did a full respiratory panel, so they were negative for struck equi EHB. Um, and so we were, we were ruling it all, everything out at that point. Um, and the horses have only come back positive for equine influenza. Um, the facility has always, every Sunday when the horses leave, has always disinfected the stalls. Um, every stall is stripped here. Um, they are sprayed down from top to bottom every single Sunday. Um, unless the horses are staying for two weeks, obviously they'll stay in the stall. But any stall that gets a horse leaves and then a new horse would come in the next week has always been completely stripped and completely sprayed down. Um, last year we had some horses that went home and developed strangles a week later and we really, really put biosecurity actions into place uh, really strongly. I really enforced them. So I, 
I'm here on Sunday night. I walk through. I know they're getting disinfected, um, and that has continued. But but that that is something that has always gone on here. Um, so since those original horses that were about 25 to 30 days ago, um, I would say I've had about 20 that I've put over in isolation. Um, some of the horses, just so everyone is aware, um, are completely asymptomatic. Uh, my recommendation for exhibitors is if they are traveling home, um, I am recommending to run an SAA. Anything that's above 50, um, I'm recommending that they don't get on a trailer and that we test them for equine influenza. Um, I would say that maybe that first or second week, uh, we had quite a few horses that showed no clinical signs. Um, and still tested positive for equine influenza. Uh, we tested them because the SAA was was above 50. Um, at that point, um, some of those horses then became clinical with a low-grade fever, treated them with banamine, um, resolved maybe a little nasal discharge, maybe a little bit of a cough, but nothing really that significant. Um, some of the horses that were asymptomatic also never, ever showed any clinical signs, but continued to shed for a solid 10, 14 days. So I think it's important everyone knows that horses are not showing clinical signs, but still shedding. Um, we are not releasing anyone out of our isolation um, until they're negative on a PCR. Um, for the most part, they're getting out around day 14 to day 18. I do have one of the original ones in there that's almost at day 28. Um, he was one of the originals, and I, I think he, again, had that low-grade fever, was being treated with banamine and Zax, and showed pretty hard over the weekend. Uh, he developed a little bit of a secondary pneumonia, and, and he's doing fine now. He has no, no clinical signs at the moment, but he, he's still testing positive. Um, as far as what is going on, um, I've been in very close contact with Dr. Tom Chambers. He's at the Gluck Research Institute in Lexington. We've sent him quite a bit of samples. Um, he, every time I call him, he says they're still cooking in the eggs. Um, what he believes is it's the same mutant strain that was brought over in the end of 2018. Um, it was brought over into Florida, uh, that he thinks from Britain. Um, and he feels very strongly that that is what, it, that, that that's what we're dealing with. Um, they've traced it to a horse that we think has gone up into Indiana and then came across our way into the Midwest Ohio. Um, horses that are clinical or asymptomatic but still shedding are being vaccinated. They're all up to date on vaccines. Um, and I, I can't pinpoint one vaccine company over another. Um, I've had everything from Calvenza um, to flu um, to um, Prestige and uh, Fluivert. So I can't pinpoint it to one vaccine. Um, right now, I'm, I'm down to I think I have eight horses over there uh, pending negative PCRs. Uh, hopefully, we'll have the results back this evening. Um, I will say, as far as the horse show, it's still going on. They're still disinfecting, and I would say that it's really dying down. I didn't have any new cases last week. We're really, really pushing for people to take temperatures twice a week, and my recommendation to people uh, the one to come and show here is obviously definitely be taking temperatures twice a week and if they can to provide some sort of isolation or quarantine for their horses when they go home for two weeks. Um, if they are getting on a very long trailer ride, again, I'm really pushing to try to run the SAA. So that's kind of where we are here. Um, I know there's been a number of horses that have gone home and have gotten other horses sick with influenza, some of the horses that have been affected that are not vaccinated at home. Um, I've heard from referring veterinarians are uh, holding a fever for four to five days, obviously a lot sicker than the ones that, that have been properly vaccinated. Um, but to me, that's the biggest, the biggest threat of the situation is, and the reason that we chose as a facility to inform everyone and be very proactive was so that people, A, could make good decisions for their horses coming in and B, um, going home could make good decisions and, and really think about quarantining, not exposing them to, to young or older horses. Um, and speaking of age, I've got horses, everything from four-year-olds that are very clinical to I've got 15, 17-year-olds in here that are clinical. So it, it's really not age-dependent. So um, hopefully I answered the questions. I, I guess I'm going to unmute myself. And then if anyone has any questions, please let me know.
Thank you very much, Holly. Uh, that's very good information, especially leading up to competition season here in Canada. Um, Next up, we have uh, Dr. Mary Bell from the EC Health and Welfare Expert Group, and she's going to give us an overview of the importance of vaccinating for contagious and infectious disease and for proper herd health when attending off-property functions like competitions and clinics. So with that, Mary, just a reminder, star six to unmute, and uh, the floor is yours. Yes, and I just want to say to Holly, can you hang on? Because right at the end, uh, probably people have questions. Certainly, I do. Um, I, this experience at a major event in Ohio reminds us of the importance of vaccinating our horses properly and the importance of taking biosecurity measures. Today, I'm referring you to excellent sites for information related to biosecurity and providing a brief discussion of four viruses. Three of these and those viruses are respiratory viruses. Three uh, have licenses at, that are available in Canada uh, and are available in Canada, and one has a conditional license in the U.S. These four viruses are ones for which Equestrian Canada is preparing to take action regarding their vaccinations. And um, uh, I really can't get heavily into biosecurity. It's a frequently overlooked process and it's important, can't be emphasized enough. There's several resources for learning more about biosecurity uh, that are Canadian resources. And since every facility varies, it can be very helpful to involve your veterinarian in the development of your biosecurity plan. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, has partnered with Equestrian Canada EC um, to uh, develop a biosecurity, an equine biosecurity standard and an equine biosecurity producer guide. Both of these are available on the EC website under industry and health and welfare and on the CFIA website. Equestrian Canada has an excellent webinar on biosecurity and uh, the emergency action plan for competition managers, which contains information. And both of these are also available, the same site, EC, Industry, Health and Welfare. There are several other sites available on some of the provincial ministries of agriculture provincial sport bodies, the Horse and Welfare Alliance, HWAC, Equine Guelph, and some of the breed organizations. I'm quoting from the standard here, health management plans which include biosecurity and vaccinations reduce the risk of introduction or spread of infectious disease. Biosecurity protocols are guidelines intended to prevent the introduction or spread of disease within a farm or to other farms. Horses that are newly introduced or returning to the farm present the greatest risk for infectious disease. And, and certainly this was emphasized earlier in Holly's talk. For some diseases, a horse can be a carrier of the disease without showing any clinical signs. And these carrier animals play a significant role in the transmission of disease. Okay, so we have two types of respiratory virus that are viral respiratory virus diseases for which we have good vaccination, equine influenza and equine herpes virus one and four. The most common form of transmission for influenza is airborne. Infective horses release in infected droplets into the air by coughing or snorting, and then those droplets are inhaled by horses within 50 yards of the affected horse. Horses can also be exposed to the virus by coming into contact with contaminated surfaces like stalls, wash racks, I think are big ones, stocks, water sources, feed, pack, 
grooming equipment such as rub rags, transport vehicles. Humans can spread the virus from horse to horse with contaminated hands and clothing. Standardly, the incubation period for this virus can be as short as 24 hours and up to three days, and horses normally shed the virus from seven to 10 days, but as Holly indicated, they certainly could do that longer. The shedding period is shorter for horses with a good level of immunity from previous exposure or from vaccination. Horses rarely shed the virus once the clinical signs are gone. That's not always the case, but that's usually the case. And this is a virus that is not normally plagued by carriers. However, it can take from three weeks to six months for a horse to be able to return to work. Horses must have time for adequate healing of the respiratory epithelium. Remember that it's important that vaccinated horses will still shed virus. So exposed unvaccinated horses can contract the full-blown disease. Equine herpes virus 1 in 4, EHV 1 in 4, spread from horse to horse through contact with nasal discharge and aerosol droplets, and again, contaminated surfaces, humans, pets, wildlife, can spread the disease. Uh, wildlife and pets on contaminated feet or hair. Viruses can last in the environment in ideal conditions up to 20, uh, sorry, 35 days, but normally less than seven. However, this, is a, this information is a reminder of how important it is to thoroughly clean all contact surfaces of any organic material and to disinfect. Information regarding this process and suggested disinfectants can be found uh, at the sites that I indicated. Uh, another site that I'll add is the Equine Disease Communication Center, EDCC in the U.S., which also provides links. These viruses commonly manifest, this is EHV, as a mild respiratory disease. EHV-4 occasionally causes abortion in unvaccinated mares. Um, uh, equine herpes virus myeloencephalitis can be the result of either virus and is rare but it's devastating. Incubation period two to 10 days. Horses can shed the virus before any clinical signs. And this is a disease where infected horses can be carriers. In outbreaks, horses that are directly exposed in the directly exposed area usually have movement restrictions for 14 to 28 days, depending on the strain and type of disease that occurs. This does not include those horses with neurological signs. They are typically separated longer. Normally, we see the respiratory disease in weanlings and yearlings. They have contracted it from older horses. Not only does this disease have carriers, it also has horses in which the virus can remain latent for life, a little like chickenpox. Stress can reactivate shedding. Remember that these viruses can be carried in the donkey and mule population, and this population is less likely to demonstrate clinical signs. Proper vaccination of the entire herd is the best way to inhibit virus shedding and virus transmission. Vaccination is effective against the respiratory disease and, and the abortion, but there is no vaccination that prevents the neurological form of the disease, EHM. This is the one that frightens us most. Vaccination is the only way to reduce virus shedding and therefore the only way to reduce the spread of EHM. There is some suggestion that it is wise to vaccinate for EHV1 and 4 before 35 days from the time the horse is likely to be stressed, say before they start competing. 
Some provincial ministries of agriculture take regulatory action in cases of EHM. The USEF has had a vaccination requirement that was introduced in November of 2015, and you can find the rule in the USEF rule book, GR845. EC is instituting a vaccination regulation that will go into effect in 2020. It will require proper vaccinations for the three viruses I discussed for all equines that enter EC-sanctioned sites within six months of competition. Uh, there may be a 21-day leniency, um, and they must have been vaccinated prior to seven days from entering the competition or um, uh, event grounds. Precipitants will need to be aware of this rule and prepare their vaccination schedule in advance. So consult with your veterinarians and determine a good schedule to be on. There will be a required form and, well, uh, and participants will need to bring that form with them to all competitions. Please be aware that this is coming. Once the rule and the process is finalized, EC and provincial members will be informed. I've been asked to mention that if there's an outbreak at a competition and your horse wasn't vaccinated and for some reason it was, you know, that your form uh, wasn't looked at or you don't have a form, you could be liable. The third virus that does have a profound effect on our young horse population and that has been found in the performance and pleasure population is equine rhinitis A virus. This virus may cause mild to severe respiratory tract disease affecting both the upper and the lower airways. It also can be associated with leg edema. The incubation period is three to seven days, and the duration is usually four to five days. ERAV has been isolated from the nose, blood, feces, and urine samples. Shedding in the urine can be a particularly significant factor in the spread of disease. There is a vaccine that's conditionally licensed in the United States for this virus. Uh, EC is requesting that the vaccine be made available in Canada under some type of provisional process, and the company needs to know what kind of volume is likely to be required in Canada. Personally, I have had this vaccine, or sorry, this virus um, uh, as a positive uh, in virtually all of the respiratory outbreaks that I've had in my practice, and they're all mature horses. If you have a farm where a portion of your horses commingle outside with outside horses at horse shows, clinics, trail rides, you need to consider proper vaccination with these viruses, as we've discussed above. So, uh, does anyone have any questions at the end? Uh, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks, Christy. Thank you, Mary. Uh, very helpful overview. And as Mary mentioned, um, Equestrian Canada will be sure to, we're going to be doing a lot of communication about what a vaccination rule would look like, as well as how to meet compliance um, as we move further towards that. Uh, we are internally looking at how we can facilitate this process so that it's easy for compliance for competitors as well as competition organizers. Um, but it's with, with or without a rule, uh, implementing vaccination protocols and herd health with your vet is the best precautionary standard when attending competition. Um, as well, we have developed some posters that are available uh, just by emailing me house at equestrian.ca. Um, I'm also 
able to get them printed and laminated, and they are communication posters that help people to know that when you're at competition that you do have disease prevention practices in place. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about those, they are mentioned in the last issue of the What the Health newsletter, which should be on the website, or just by emailing me. Um, so up next, we have Dr. Cheryl James from the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System to give us an update on CAS. Uh, so with that, Cheryl, it's just star six to unmute, and the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Christy. Um, just uh, briefly, uh, the um, Equine Network has been working primarily recently on um, uh, getting the notifiable diseases database up and running. We have um, we have uh, a number of provinces and and the CFIA that are reporting on on diseases directly to the CAS website right now, but but they're not in a format that can be easily compiled or or analyzed. If you want to sort of very quickly um, look up how many how many cases of a particular disease were happened over a period of time or in a particular geographic area. So what we're doing is we're um, we're trying to build a database uh, to collect uh, collect those data directly uh, to the uh, CAS website. So we've been working hard on that. The first thing we have done is we've prepared a graphic flow chart, which really it was to define and clarify the roles and responsibilities of all the different people that are involved in reporting on on disease. So so that's been done, and and um, you know certainly that that would be available for people to have a look at. Um, we've moved on to develop. Um, uh, a, a list of data that we want to collect. So we sort of defined exactly what is it that we want to collect and how and who's going to put it in there and how do we maintain the security of that information. And we're now working with a database programmer to to actually develop that database and, and create a user entry form so, so that we can really facilitate reporting of notifiable disease directly to the CAS website and then it would go automatically right into that database and um, um, and then that the, the data would be in a format where we can go in and add things up and analyze and look at trends. So the other thing that we've been doing is uh, developing a process. We know that um, um, uh, we have uh, a database uh, where we report to the OIE and uh, in the CFIA for immediately notifiable diseases uh, such as West Nile virus and uh, Triple E. So. We're looking, uh, because we already have that data here in the, in the database, we're looking at a process to automatically extract that data and put it into the CAS and reliable disease da database. Um, you know, as soon as the CFIA database is updated, then we would like that extracted and put into the CAS database so it would be there available on a real-time basis. And finally, we're working with um, experts on dashboard technology um, to use um, a software called Power BI. Um, and this technology will make it very easy for for um, anybody to come into the website to to display or, or query or map um, the data that we've collected on notifiable disease. Um, and then we're, we're also looking at opportunities to add more data sets into the dashboard, such as um, the uh, equine demographic data, uh, things like import-export data we might be able to get, or lab test data. So th this group has been um, extremely active, and, and I have to say that all of this work is being developed in a way um, that it is easily transferable to other species groups as well. So. Um, uh, I, you know, it's been a, a great contribution to CAS. <clears throat> um, so looking at CAS in general, um, as many of you are aware, we are um, transitioning the coordination of CAS to the National Farmed Animal Health and Welfare Council. Over the last four years, the CFIA and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada have been um, have sort of volunteered to help build the, the network, but was never intended to be a sort of a government-led initiative. It was always intended to be an industry-government collaboration. So 
it makes sense to have it um, coordinated under the council, which is a an industry government collaboration. So that process is proceeding. Recently, there was a transition plan that was posted to the CAS website. So if you are a CAS member, you will have access to that transition plan, and we invite you to have a look at it um, and make any comments um, that that you might want to make on, on that document. Um, so we're... This this year has been kind of our transition year. So um, towards the end of March, um, the CFIA will be reducing our role in in terms of actual coordination. Um, I, I don't think we'll be eliminating it uh, right away because the council is still um, waiting on their funding applications. So they need to have their funding in place, and they need to have um, to hire somebody uh, to act as a, a coordinator. So, um, so we'll still be around for the interim, and, and as such, you know, that Keith Merch will will uh, continue on past the end of March uh, to uh, continue to work with the uh, Equine Network. Um, but but over the the next little while, we will be reducing. Our, our role in actively coordinating, and and um and we're also in the process of sort of uh, drafting what our continuing role will be in in CAS because the CFIA will continue to be an active participant and supporter of CAS. Um, and the last thing I had is um, <clears throat> CAS is uh, hosting a vector-borne disease surveillance workshop in Winnipeg, March 21st and 22nd. Um, it is a multi-species. It's, it's very much a one health kind of a, a workshop, public health, wildlife, animal health, and multi-species. <clears throat> and um, that workshop will be looking at um, ways and means of uh, bringing, bringing the multiple parties involved in, in uh, vector-borne disease surveillance together and, and see if we can be a little bit more efficient uh, about how we're doing things, whether we can whole different data sets together, whether we have uh, significant gaps that we need to address. <clears throat> I, um, I have been looking for an equine representative uh, to attend that workshop, and I have not had a lot of success so far. So if there's anybody that is interested, it's a two-day workshop in Winnipeg, March 21st and 22nd, and I would be happy to send you the details. But I think, um, you know, given given issues with um, – Lyme disease, Triple E, West Nile, uh, EIA. Um, I, I would think this workshop would be of, of interest to the equine sector. So I think that's all I had for today. Thanks, Christy. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Eve Rose from the EC Equine Medications Control Committee, who's going to be giving an overview of the updated Canadian Parimutuel Agency uh, Elimination Guidelines. Uh, these these will come into effect April 1st, 2019, for all levels of EC sanctioned competition. So I will hand it over to Dr. Rose to give us a, a more in-depth update. It's just star six to unmute. Dr. Rossier, are you still on the line? Christy? Yep. If Dr. Yep. Dr. Rossier may be a little bit later in coming on, I'm not sure, but those um, uh, new gui guidelines for clearance times have been put on hold and we're continuing with the 2016 for the moment. And that just okay. happened. That just happened. Okay. I think Dr. Rossier was on the line earlier. He may just have a hard time getting unmuted. So I think until we hear from him, what we can just do is go ahead and take any questions for the first three speakers. Um, and okay. it's Christy, it's Shauna. Hi, Shauna. Um, I have Dr. Rossier's notes, and I can give just a brief 
update on sure. on that portion of it. Um, yeah. So he we did send that. He was on the call. So anyway, okay. I yeah, got I thought this I heard him earlier. Hey, that'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So Shauna no. Cooper of uh, EC. She's um, the coordinator there and is the coordinator for the Equine Medications Control Committee. So we'll just go ahead, Shauna. Yeah. Um, so just like Dr. Mary Bell said, the the CPMA elimination guidelines for 2019, they have been delayed until further notice. At this time, we don't have a new implementation date yet, but when one is announced, um, we'll be able to give everyone an appropriate adjustment period um, in order for all members to be compliant at EC competition. Um, one thing that is still in place is that as of April 1st, the elimination guidelines for products that were compounded have been removed from the list. Uh, from the elimination guideline list. That means these products are still prohibited and that CPMA is no longer providing elimination advice. And if they are going to be used, it has to be done with your own knowledge and risk. So that is something that is still coming into place. Um, and as well, the elimination guidelines for products that are no longer approved by Health Canada or not recommended for therapeutic use in horses have also been removed. So that is still effective April 1st. And uh, we will be providing a list of these products uh, in an upcoming information memo to uh, EC Sport License holders. And there will be some other updates uh, within that as well. Um, but I would prefer that Dr. Rossi give those updates over the phone, but at least I can do the, the CPMA ones here. So there is some updates coming and a memo to EC Sport License holders coming shortly. So I guess for this time, it's just important for those of you on the call who are practicing veterinarians or are uh, PTSO um, administrators that to keep an eye on those medication changes or those uh, CPMA changes and any communications that come out of the Equine Medications Control Committee and do the best of your ability to then further those communications out to your different networks. Uh, exactly. So thank you very much, Shauna. Uh, at this time, then we'll just open up the floor for questions. Uh, so, Mary, I know you said you had some questions for Holly. Maybe we'll just start there, and then we can have anybody else on who would like to ask some questions. Um, Holly, did you test for rhinitis virus on any of those horses? Um, I did not originally, but um, one pharmaceutical company in particular, uh, BI, was very interested in what was going on, and um, they took. I, I swabbed all of our horses and sent them samples, and they were testing for rhinitis, and there were no positives on any of those. Was there any – no serology was done um, before and after? Um, I, yes, there was serology done as well. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do we have any other questions for Holly? Okay, hearing none, do we have any questions for Dr. Mary Bell? Hello. Hi, Bill. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi there. Hello. Hello, this is Bill DeBerra. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I have a question for Holly. I'm sorry. I thought I was unmuted, but I wasn't. Uh, Holly, uh, what no, are you no, using? No problem. Holly, what are you using to disinfect or spray your stalls? In the evening, what compounds or, or disinfectants are you using? Yeah, actually, the University of Kentucky came in last year and made recommendations for us. Um, and it's actually hospital-grade uh, disinfectant. I don't have the exact component of it. I could take a picture of it and, and share it with you guys if you'd like to see it. Um, but I had, you know, we had some research done, A, with the disinfectants, um, I, I know it's hospital grade, and then I know that um, the ventilation is also changing here, which is a big question that people have. And the dump, the air is actually being dumped three times an hour the, um, out of every barn and every big arena, um, and they're looking to step that up. So by next year, it's going to be circulating even more often than that, but right now they're dumping it uh, manually three times an hour. I, that's a question I get a lot. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. Uh, have you had any signs that you are aware of of immunity to the disinfectant that you're using? Uh, no. 
I, I, I mean, I, I guess I can't answer that. I, I don't know for sure, but um, I, I feel pretty strongly about, you know, the university's research uh, with the disinfectant that they're using. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what it is because I know that they, they had some specialists come in and actually work on it. So I, I'm assuming that they know what they're doing. Um, and, and like I said, I can get the label off of that if you guys would like to see, but I, I, I don't. I don't know. It, it's not just us, um, just so everyone is aware of that. There's quite a few shows that's dealing with this. I think we are just the ones that have been the most um, public and forthcoming about it. There has been Which I think some... is very commendable. I'm sorry. There, sorry there's, been, there's been some indication that uh, although some uh, fairgrounds and show places and so on and so forth are are spraying, they still have recognized some disease and or uh, bugs that are traveling and in spite of their efforts to to uh, uh, slow down the transition. But uh, so any information that we could get on this would be helpful. Sure, can absolutely. I, I, go, ahead. go ahead. I'd just like to ask in conjunction with that, because it's a, certainly an issue that, that I find, how easy are you finding compliance to remove all the organic matter before disinfecting? As far as organic matter, do you mean savings in the stall, or do you mean the entire facility? I mean anything that would be organic that would have been in a contaminated area. That, it, that's a pretty tough situation. I mean, this facility is it's huge. It's almost a mile from one end of the barn to the to the other end of the stalls at the other end of the of the barn, and it's all connected. Um, absolutely disinfecting absolutely every single thing would literally be impossible. And as we know with influenza that it's airborne, um, it, it obviously can be spread by, um, by inanimate objects, um, but actually disinfecting every last little piece here would be literally impossible to do. Um, I, I wasn't meaning the disinfecting, I meant the cleaning, that, 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 the cleaning before you disinfect, that's all I meant. Oh, that, I mean, that is, it is being, stalls are being completely stripped. Okay. Because I think that, that, that's the place where I think we see failure with sometimes sure. failures reported with disinfectants is because sure. of disinfectants. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. So they have, um, and they've done that for as many, you know, I've been here for five or six years now, and they have always completely removed everything from the stalls uh, with shovels. It gets removed, and then they sweep it all out. I mean, it is, and I'm here on Sunday nights. It takes them from about 6 o'clock Sunday night until about noon the next day to do the entire facility. Um, and I'm often here late at night with colleagues or, or whatever, and it is it is definitely getting done. There's no question about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Holly. And I think it's very um, commendable that you guys are being open and public and sharing information. I know that we had some cases of strangles in New Brunswick this year, and it was we took very good recognition to the barns that were public and post self-quarantines because, I mean, these things happen, and it's only protecting um, – everybody else and, and your own horses to communicate and make sure that everybody can take precautionary measures. So I would like to thank you very much for coming on the call today and discussing this and providing us with as much information as you did. It's very uh, commendable and appreciated. Sure. Thank you. I really appreciate it. As you can imagine, it's um, not always the easiest thing to get the horse show to be public about it as it hurts the numbers here. Um, but it's, They've been really great to work with. And um, just another little piece of information, the pharmaceutical companies have stepped up tremendously. Um, most of uh, BI and Merck and Zoetis will offer up to a $5,000 guarantee if the horse has been vaccinated within the last six months with one of their products. So the pharmaceutical companies here are literally covering the expenses, which are not horrible, but 
are covering the expenses for these horses, um, the Banamine, Vensa Pullman, them being over in the isolation barn. So it's just a good piece of information for veterinarians to know uh, that the pharmaceutical companies are helping out. Thank you, that's great to hear. So um, I have received an email from uh, Dr. Rossi that he is on the line. I'm just gonna unmute all the lines. So if you could, if you are on the line and you can mute yourself, like by pressing star six or just muting on your phone, that would help. But I would just like to give Dr. Rossi the chance if he is still on the line. So just give me one second here. The leader has unmuted your line. Yes, hello, Christy, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. I've been here all this time, but completely unable to speak. Okay, well, you have the floor now and I can hear you just okay. So Shauna, uh, did you hear that Shauna did provide a bit of an update, but just give you- a Yes, and I missed, I, I was trying to call in when she, called back in when she was reading that, but I'm not sure how far she got. <laughs> So, yes, we learned yesterday that um, the, the uh, implementation of the CPMA, the new CPMA guidelines was being delayed until further notice. Um, I think Mary addressed that earlier on. Uh, we don't have a new implementation date yet. Um, it was supposed to be April 1st, but now it, obviously it's delayed. Um, I was told there will be obviously an adjustment period before a new date is, is uh, you know, before new implementation starts so people can be uh, compliant to any changes in, in following those, the, the new program. So uh, what it means for EEC members and EC competitions right now is that testing proceeds as it was in 2018 um, in terms of CPMA elimination guidelines. Those are unchanged. There, we have one word of caution, and I think that there has been some substances that were, or medications, compounded medications, uh, which had an elimination guideline in the book or in the list, they've been removed from the list. So you have to be very cautious if you're using compounded products that uh, the elimination guideline may have been uh, removed from the book or the list. And this is obvious, you know, because we can't guarantee what's in a, you know, we can't give an elimination guideline. CPMA can't give an elimination guideline on a compounded uh, product. So uh, if you use those, you have to use those as, with your own planning and uh, knowledge. Now we will, Include, we have an upcoming EC um, EMCC um, update memo, and we will include the substances that have been removed from the list in that memo. Um, I don't know if you guys talked about the uh, rule changes. EMCC um, had its annual meeting uh, just before Christmas. Basically, program continues as, as is for 2019. Um, with the same testing directives and, and sampling process and the use of Maxam laboratory. There is a new um, prohibited practice that will be put in place for 2019, which is that it is prohibited to administer any substance or medication other than fluids or antibiotics to a horse by injection on the day it competes, but prior to it competing. So it's a little tricky to, to put in words, but we don't want horses to get injections just before they go and compete, basically. So um, horses that compete after 6 p.m. can be treated by injection until 10 a.m. that morning. And uh, we recognize the use of fluids and antibiotics can be given up to six hours prior to competition, but only when given by a licensed veterinarian. And this rule is to um, keep EC, the EMCC program in, in line with what's happening with USEF, FEI, and other um, you know, regulatory or jurisdictions. Um, and, and, you know, EC's mission to preserve the welfare of the horse. So um, we, the penalty for an infraction to this rule is a yellow card uh, being issued and the horse being eliminated from competition. 
a second infraction in the lifetime uh, will result in, again, a yellow card, elimination from competition, and an automatic um, hearing. I, I would like to stress the, the, that this rule does not supersede the elim CPMA el elimination guideline. In other words, if, you're, um, if a horse is being treated with a product or a medication that has, thir has a 36-hour elimination guideline by CPMA, that 36 hours still stands. It does not mean that you can give it before 10 a.m. if the horse competes um, that night. Okay, so the the normal CPLA guidelines super is still uh, are valid for all um, medications in that list. Uh, in 2019, um, we will. Yes, hello. Um, a positive test to medroxyprogesterone uh, will be considered as a class 5 infraction. Um, that means a $750 fine with no suspension. In view, this is a change. Last year was warnings, but we've moved on to this class 5 level infraction. Um, in view of the products, the medroxyprogesterone's prolonged elimination profile, uh, a second positive test within 30 days. So if the horse gets tested again within 30 days of the original test, we w a, a second positive test will not be issued. But if it tests positive after 30 days of the first one, a second, um, another class five infraction will be issued but they won't be considered as a third or a second, you know, a, a, an adding infraction. It would just be another class five infraction. And uh, the other changes regarding um, biphosphonate, well, it's not a change for biphosphonates. The rule will, testing will continue for 2019 as per 2018 CPMA notification. A 30-day elimination guideline is, is recommended for both OSFOS and uh, Tildren, so Clodronate and Teludronate. I will stress there's no elimination guideline for the other biphosphonates, so if they're found, it is uh, an inf a positive test. Um, for, 20, uh, the, for 2019, um, we will issue warning letters. Uh, as opposed with no fine and no suspension to any positive tests for OSFOS and um, children. Um, but class three, starting in 2020, there, uh, class three level infractions will be uh, enforced. So that's a fine and a suspension starting in 2020 for biphosphonates. For 2019, it's still warning letters. And I want to stress that the finding of any biphosphonate in a three or a, a one, a two, or a three-year-old uh, will result in a positive infraction, class three infraction. That's because we know that biphosphonate can affect bone maturation, and um, it's not indicated its use is the use of biphosphonates in horses younger than four years of age is not recommended. So uh, lastly, I'll say that we um, are shortly, there should be the publication of the 2019 EMCC Medications Guidebook, which is uh, intended to help people understand the rules and how to apply them. And this will be um, published and issued sh shortly, both in paper form and um, online. And that's all my comments um, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rossier. Are there any questions? I'll just give everybody a second. They shouldn't be muted, so don't press star six this time or you will mute yourself. Uh, this is Bill DeVar, HVAC. Uh, Dr. Dr. James, uh, am I on? Hello, Dr. Yeah. James, would you send HVAC the Winnipeg criteria? Oh, we may have lost her. Christy, would you like to? Uh, um, yeah, I'll follow up with Dr. Cheryl and CC uh, <coughs> HVAC in it. Thank you. Uh, 
Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's Carol. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yes, Bill, I'll send you that information right away, and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay, if there are no questions remaining, uh, we will adjourn for today. So the next um, national call is the first Wednesday in April. I believe that is April 3rd. Um, if there's anybody who would like to provide an update on the April call, uh, just give me an email again at khouse at equestrian.ca. Uh, as well, you can expect to see the agenda circulated uh, usually between seven to 10 days or prior to the call with a reminder on social media uh, three to three or two days before the call. So again, if anybody would like to put forward uh, any topics or be a speaker, feel free to email me anytime, uh, even if it's for a call in August. I have a sign-up sheet, and I can mark you down and get back in touch and send you a reminder then. So thank you very much to all of our speakers today. All the information is very helpful. We will be focusing on biosecurity and herd management on our national calls leading up to competition season. Uh, as well, you can expect to see some short videos on Facebook about the importance of vac vaccinating. And again, those biosecurity posters that we've been working on are available. You can have uh, them printed and laminated, and they will be put up on our website shortly so you're able to print them off yourself. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great day.